There's this thing called, you know, rational actor models and rational choice theory. And it's a commonly used concept. It basically says that someone is a rational actor if they weigh the costs and benefits of any particular decision and pick the decision where ultimately they get best personal outcome. The problem is that with terrorists, there's no cost they're not willing to pay. And they're willing to not only take their own lives, they can take their families' lives, they can even kill members of their own community. And so there was an alternative model that was created called uh, the devoted actor model. A devoted actor is someone who is willing to make extreme costly sacrifices for their values or their group. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Dave Brundle, and you're listening to Going to Extremes, a podcast series by the International Hub on Behavioural Insights to Counterterrorism, which is a program office of the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism. What you just heard at the top of the episode was today's guest, Nafiz Hamid. Nafiz is a senior fellow at the International Centre for the Study of Radicalisation at London's King's College. In this episode, Nafiz will continue the topic of engagement with radical or terrorist groups. He will talk about his own empirical research and what has been learnt about the role that social exclusion can play in radicalization and the influences that social group dynamics and shared values can have in reducing engaging in extremist activities. And as always, Ken Reedy, who is the research and best practices lead at the BI Hub in Doha, We'll be putting the fees in the hot seat and asking the big questions. It's a great chat. Let's dive in. Nafiz, welcome on board. Thank you so much. We're talking engagement and terrorism today, and I'd like to start with your PhD. So among other things, you concluded with two fascinating insights into radicalized behavior, and that's regarding social exclusion and social norms. Could you walk us through those two studies? My partner in crime in a lot of this work was uh, Dr. Clara Pretis at the Autonomous University of Barcelona. Uh, we were part of a larger team through an organization called Artists International, uh, including other researchers such as Scott Atran, Jeremy Ginges, Hamad Sheikh. One thing that we were kind of co-developing together is there's this thing called, you know, rational actor models and rational choice theory. And people who studied economics or even international relations probably will have come across this, this term. It's a commonly used concept. It basically says that someone is a rational actor if they weigh the costs and benefits of any particular decision and pick the decision where ultimately they get the best personal outcome. This is not only used for like microeconomic decisions, but even the idea is that when it comes to international relations, uh, this is the whole idea behind why you try to incentivize countries to behave a certain way using things like foreign aid packages, those are the benefits, and then sanctions, those are the costs. And it works pretty well for most things. But the problem is that with terrorists, there's no cost they're not willing to pay. And they're willing to not only take their own lives, they can take their families' lives, they can even kill members of their own community. And so it became clear to us that rational actor models, that the assumptions behind it don't really apply. And so there was an alternative model that was created called uh, the devoted actor model. And the devoted actor model says that basically uh, a devoted actor is someone who is willing to make extreme costly sacrifices for their values or their group. And I should just preface this with that a devoted actor doesn't have to be a bad person. You can look at Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King Jr. as all devoted actors. And 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 so in that sense, I mean, it's kind of, I, I can understand people listening to this thinking, wait, are you lumping Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela in the same category as members of ISIS and Al-Qaeda? In this regard, in this one way, in this idea that you're willing to, to make extreme costly sacrifices for your causes, yes. Obviously, the ideologies and what you're willing to sacrifice for are as, as different as you can possibly imagine <laughs> between, mm. you know, the, the p- people like Gandhi and Mandela versus people like who are in ISIS and Al-Qaeda. So this concept of sacred values that we were looking at is, uh, is an idea that it's, it's a subset of moral values. If something is sacred to you, you're not going to be thinking about it in instrumental terms. You won't be willing to trade it off. It's sacred because it's non-fungible with the profane. 
Uh, you can't buy this value off someone and you can't really convince them, hey, if I give you enough personal benefits, will you just give up on this issue? And again, those those sacred values could be human rights issues. It could be things related to freedom of speech. It doesn't have to be religious in any particular way. Or if you look at any movement where there's intractability, basically, you'll find that there are these sacred values that are at the core of it. And that's what creates this difficulty. And when people feel that their sacred values come under threat, they're willing to muster the will to fight and die for those values, right? Fighting and dying could be in the Mahatma Gandhi sense of like, I'm willing to kill myself and, you know, inflict harm upon myself and die myself. Or it could be in the jihadi sense of I'm willing to kill other people including myself. So we knew we want to look at sacred values. And of course, at this time, this is when the caliphate was sort of at its zenith. And we wanted to look at it within the uh, the, the jihadist movement. So we started working with researchers uh, in Barcelona, like Clara Pretes and Oscar Villarroya, because we want to go one step further. We're like, okay, we want to focus on, on uh, what motivates people with sort of jihadist sympathies. But we also want to look at their brains, what happens neurally when they're processing their sacred values. It was going to be part field interviews, part psychometric surveys, part behavioral psychology experiments, part neuroscience. And the goal was to fill in, like, this is this such a huge gap in in the literature, um, in terrorism literature. So we really wanted to sort of methodologically fill in this gap. So we zeroed in on Spain, which regularly ranks as one of the top countries in Europe for jihadist recruitment. Uh, The region of Barcelona is the country's primary hotspot. And we focused in on the the Pakistani and the Moroccan communities. And the reason for that is because those are the two top two communities for recruitment into jihadism. Hmm. So I spent a couple of years uh, with these groups, spending time doing field work myself, face-to-face uh, interviews. And based off of those interviews, we built up these psychometric surveys. And those psychometric surveys measured tons of things, including figuring out what people's sacred values were, figuring out what are realistic sort of extreme costly sacrifices people are willing to make, various uh, radicalization measures that were sensitive enough. And so for the Pakistani community, it was it was a smaller uh, psychometric sample size. It was about 150 or so people. Uh, and then for the Moroccan diaspora community, it was closer to 550. So, so we have this sample. And the idea in terms of designing the studies was saying, okay, so we know we can't move a devoted actor using material costs and benefits. So what is the logic? What is the actual levers of control that you have over a devoted actor? What can you play with? What can you alter as independent variables that may change and alter their willingness to fight and die? And so we thought, okay, if material rewards and costs aren't it, what about social costs and rewards? Meaning, what about how, in terms of increasing willingness to fight and die, sort of how the how the outgroup or one of the other outgroups behaves towards us? So, for example, we were we know that social exclusion plays a a big role. It's been an observation that's been made in a lot of societies in Somalia, Nigeria, and Syria, and Pakistan. Oftentimes, you have these minority groups that feel some sense of marginalization who then move more towards extremism, right? But obviously, we can't just say, well, you know, you socially exclude someone on the street, they're going to go become a terrorist. I mean, that would be way too simplistic. The idea is that most of us hold multiple identities. And... It's possible that if one of those identity groups that we may already have some friction with uh, marginalizes us, it may decrease our identification with that group and increase our identification with another group that maybe sees itself as opposing the group that just marginalized us. Mm -hmm. So we needed to find people who, in some sense, have uh, in the Moroccan diaspora community who have one foot in the identity group of being Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then they have another foot in the identity group of jihadism, which means you have to go for people who are at a very early stage of radicalization, right? So they're not not fully committed yet because then they wouldn't really care what the out-group thinks at that point because they're they're, they're totally ensconced in in their extremist network. 
So we did. We found people who basically, you know, we in, in these surveys, we asked questions about their support for uh, jihadism. We asked questions for their support about um, uh, strict Sharia, about establishment of the caliphate and all these different issues. And we were able to find people who held some of these values to be very important to them and agreed with these values. And they said that they would be willing to do something even violent in defense of some of these values. So we said, okay, they have some jihadist sympathies. They're not, they're not totally clear and coherent. It's pretty early days. They weren't the most extreme people even that we collected in that database, but they're, they're kind of exactly the people that we want. So we recruit these people into the, uh, to the study. And what we do is we, for half of the, so we recruit about 38 of these people. And for about half of them, we, we, we use, well, for all of them, we, we make them play this game called um, Cyberball. Cyberball is a game that's been used to experimentally create feelings of social exclusion. Mm-hmm. And it's a very strong and it's a very simple game. And it's almost silly if you hear it. You, you probably wouldn't even believe that it would actually work if you just, it's, it's a virtual toss ball game where it's, you're playing a video game and there's a little avatar for you. And then there's three other players. Um, in our case, the three other players were other Spanish players. They could see the avatar, the picture of the of the, of the other three guys um, who look Spanish. We gave them all very kind of stereotypically Catalan names like Jordi and things yep. like that. And so they were tossing the ball virtually with these other three players. And they think the other three players are, are real. We kind of led them to believe that. And they're tossing the ball. And in, in the control condition, the, the Spanish players toss the ball to the Moroccan diaspora participant as many times as they pass the ball to each other. In the social exclusion condition, they toss the ball, they, they toss the ball a few times amongst each other, and then they just stop passing the ball to the Moroccan diaspora participant and just toss the ball to each other. And it has such a strong effect size. Even this, even this little two-minute virtual toss ball game really affects them. Mm-hmm. Then we put everyone in the brain scanner, the fMRI. Think of MRI as like a photograph and an fMRI is like a film. It's just many pictures being taken and it measures your blood oxygenation level. It shows where the blood is flowing in the brain. Therefore, that part of the brain is more active during a particular task. When they all get in the scanner, they're sitting up and they're looking at a screen. And in the screen, they can see different values being presented to them that we know are either sacred or non-sacred based off of our field work. So it includes things like, uh, you know, support for arm jihad, uh, strict sharia, establishment of a caliphate, etc. And underneath it, they have a seven-point scale of their willingness to fight and die. So they're saying, like, how much would you be willing to fight and die on a scale of one to seven, seven being martyrdom, one being nothing at all, for each of these values? And then afterwards, they get out of the scanner and we do a bunch of post-scan measures with them, looking for neuropsychiatric disorders, IQ, um, emotional inventories, all sorts of stuff. What we found was that social exclusion basically had no impact whatsoever on sacred values. Mm -hmm. So we found that whether you were socially excluded or socially excluded or included, there was it was always the same part of the brain that activated. It's called the left inferior frontal gyrus. And it's a part of the brain that's basically used for rule processing. Which makes sense because sacred values are just these rules that you apply. They're like deontological moral values. You're not looking at context and nuance and any of this stuff. You're just, this is the rule. This is, this is, this is what I'm going to do for it. However, for the non-sacred values is where we saw the shift. People who were socially excluded, their non-sacred values, when they were, when they were evaluating them, started to activate that same area of the brain that's normally only online for sacred values. Now they're socially excluded. Now the non-sacred values are activating areas of the brain only for sacred values. And not only that, they now start reporting their willingness to fight and die for those values more uh, at a similar level that they were reporting for their sacred values. And when they got out of the scanner, we asked them to reevaluate the sacredness of each value using our various psychometric measures. And we started seeing that some of the non-sacred values were now being uh, placed in the sacred value column, so to speak. Yeah. So we're basically seeing the sacralization process taking place as a result of social exclusion. Um, so that was the first time that that had been you know, experimentally shown. It was the first time where sacred values were shown as the mechanism by which social exclusion actually increases radicalization. And it was the first time that we sh- we showed any neuroscience evidence for that. And of course, that's a worrying finding. You know, if you, if, if if more values become sacred, that means there's less and less tools in your toolkit if you're working in PCVE 
the values are non-sacred. You have all sorts of tools at your disposal, including material uh, incentives that can be used to pull someone away. Once it becomes sacred, now this person's really moving not only closer to the edge of violence, but it's just int- it's, they're moving they're just moving towards more intractability. Really, the problem is how social exclusion can become a force multiplier for people who already have some sympathies to begin with. So social exclusion by itself may be bad in a lot of ways because it creates aggression, it creates fissures in society. It doesn't necessarily mean this person's going to become an extremist unless they already have been exposed and are somewhat sort of identifying with the group to begin with. It just just amps up their level of radicalization, essentially. Then for the next study, we're like, okay, so we, we were able to make people more radicalized. Uh, how do we make them less radicalized? How do we pull someone back from the edge of violence? Uh, and so for that, we, we, we looked at the Pakistani uh, diaspora data. And for that, we were able to find much more radicalized people. We were able to find uh, 30 people who were full supporters of Lashkari Taiba. So for them, we're saying, okay, well, these people are pretty close to the edge of violence. How do we make them less radicalized? So again, we're leading here on, we're kind of brainstorming what would make someone who is a devoted actor now, who holds all these values to be sacred, less likely to engage in a violent act. And what we thought is, okay, so what makes someone more likely to get violent is being excluded by a kind of outgroup, let's say. But I, we would imagine that what would make someone less radicalized is the opinions of the in-group. And if that in-group is telling you, hey, we don't want you to do this, this is bad, this, we, don't, we don't approve of this, you're probably less likely as a, as a devoted actor of that group to engage in that behavior. So what we did is we had these, the, the, these 30 guys, we put them in the scanner, just like the Moroccans, they were looking at their, their, their values that were sacred and non-sacred and measuring their willingness to fight and die for each value. Then for the second part of the study, we say, okay, now we're going to show you those same values again. And this time, we're going to show you what the average Pakistani community's response was to each of these values. And they thought it was real data. They knew we were going out there and doing surveys, so they believed it. But reality, in reality, it was an experimental manipulation. Half the time, for half the values, uh, the, the community feedback was the same as theirs, mm-hmm. as the participants. And half the time, it was lower. We wanted to have a third condition where it was higher as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, We couldn't implement it because we were getting ceiling effects. Basically, they were already very, they were so high in their willingness to fight and die for values that it just didn't make sense to say that anybody was higher. And so then they they then just kind of passively observe, uh, okay, like like this this was your response. You said seven out of seven on this value. This was your peer group's response. They said, let's say four out of seven. What we found was interesting is that when they were evaluating their willingness to fight and die for their sacred values, uh, an area of the brain that is normally, I should, I should preface this by saying like normally when, when you and I make decisions about the world, we have these two parts of the brain that are kind of working in tandem. One is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, which is implicated in cognitive control, self-control, deliberation, and another part of the brain called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is about integrating emotions into into our decision-making. And normally we have these two parts of the brain working in tandem. So the uh, typical example I give is you're out, you know, having dinner with a friend. Uh, The waiter comes and shows you like a dessert menu. There's a nice tiramisu on there. You go, oh, that looks good. When you say that looks good, I want that, that's your ventromedial prefrontal cortex integrating emotions in, in, into your decision. But you might say, ah, that's going to be a lot of calories. I just worked out. I'm trying to lose weight. That would be your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex coming in with some cognitive control, suppressing the other area of the brain. And that's how normal decision making works. And that is basically what we saw with the with Lashkari Taiba supporters when they were looking at their non sacred values. We saw these two areas of the brain working in tandem. However, for the sacred values, we just see that whole area that's related to cognitive control. That just goes offline, just not even online. So what we found was that when they saw that their peer group disagreed or basically had lower willingness to fight and die, that part of the brain, the self-control, cognitive control part of the brain that was offline came back online. And not only that, we saw that they then explicitly lowered their own willingness to fight and die uh, to match that, of the, to conform to the peer groups. And the degree to which they lowered their own willingness to fight and die 
uh, predicted the degree to which that area of the brain came back online. And not only that, before those two brain, those part of the brains weren't even communicating. They started to communicate with each other again. We saw functional connectivity reconnecting. So essentially, just something as simple as showing them that your peer group were not extremists disagree with your willingness to fight and die. And this is the important part is that they're not disagreeing with their values, right? They're not disagreeing with the end goal. What they're disagreeing with is the actions that the person is willing to take in defense of those values. Yeah, yeah. So two really important findings. One, if you socially exclude people during that early phase of uh, radicalization, you may make them more likely to be violent. And the other insight was that you can use social norms to ensure that people stay within an acceptable behavioral envelope. Less counter-narrative and more, this is what your friends think. That's right. Okay, okay. Um, and I'm wondering about the, the implications there, right? So you've, you've spoken and written about communications implications before, particularly with regards to social media. Could you talk us through how our responses may inadvertently make things worse? And more importantly, how how we should respond instead? Yeah, this became really obvious to me um, when we started seeing the rise of uh, white nationalist, white yeah. supremacist terrorism, uh, largely in the U.S. and other places. Now, one thing that I always observed, especially from the left, was every time there was a jihadist attack, um, it was oftentimes people on the left who would say, let's not blame all Muslims for this. Let's not blame Islam for this. That basically does what the terrorist group wants. The left always understood that that's what the terrorist group... The point of terrorism, by definition, is that the targets of the attack are not the actual purpose of the attack. Al-Qaeda didn't have a particular grudge against people who were working in the... Um, in the Twin yeah. Towers, yeah. right? The, the point is the, it's the ripple effect that the terrorist attack has on society, whether that means that the country's going to engage in bad foreign policy, or it's going to lead to fear or division or yeah. infighting or over-securitization or whatever it is. Yeah. So it's that ripple effect that they have. We have the power to determine how, how far that ripple effect goes, right? Yeah. Based off of how we react. If we react in the right way, we can contain the blast radius, the, mm -hmm. the, the virtual blast radius of a terrorist attack mm -hmm. to just the attack itself. But if we start engaging in divisive rhetoric, well, then that virtual blast radius will grow much larger. And then that is what the terrorists basically want. It'll, it'll play into their hands, essentially. Now, the left always seemed to understand this when it came to jihadist terrorism, to be very careful in our language, very specific, not start blaming larger groups than what's necessary. Yeah. Uh, however, they seem to take total leave of that understanding uh, when it came to far right-wing attacks. And I started seeing leaders within public intellectuals and even politicians uh, going out and saying, you know, this is, if you voted for Trump, then you have blood on your hands. Uh, you know, if you're even a conservative, this is this is where your ideology leads. Um, all voters of Trump are basically apologists for terrorism. They were saying all the terrible things that you're that they knew not to say when they came to jihadism. Yeah, yeah. They're making all the mistakes that they should that they shouldn't be, which which is which is yeah, blaming the wider group, creating more divisions, which creates more polarization, um, which creates a, a counter reaction. When the truth is, I mean, and, and again, so that's social, that's an example of social exclusion, right? Yeah. That's social exclusion on the social media space. And we know what happens, um, especially for someone who's maybe on the edge of violence, mm -hmm. right? Maybe you're someone who's kind of like flirting with some of these white nationalist mm -hmm. ideas or white supremacist ideas, but they don't really know exactly where they fall. Our studies show that that kind of rhetoric, even on, on social media, can push them over the edge and, and into the arms of white nationalist or white supremacist groups. Instead, what you want is the voices from within the right, people who they see as their peer group, right? Who they see as leaders, as credible messengers. As so if, we, if they see those people who they trust condemning the attacks, then that's social norm interventions, right? That's the second study, right? That shows you that that's going to be the thing that has the biggest influence on them. So amplify those voices instead. You can retweet and share those messages as much as possible because that's the message that's going to have the biggest impact. What about offline in a sort of person-to-person -person format? 
How should we talk to people who've gone down an ideological or a conspiracy theory rabbit hole? I've, I've tried the whole rational argument thing and got nowhere. In fact, it even backfired once. So, yes, yeah, so, I mean, I've, I had some friends who, who went down there, the QAnon hole, right, right in the beginning of the uh, pandemic. So I started pivoting my research to just doing interviews with them. And I mean, the main thing that I learned both from my own personal experience as well as just from the general research is the importance of staying connected. And, and a lot of research has, has, has shown this, what has the most influence on people, what, what's, what's happening on the public side of their social media or, what, or what's going on on the DM side of their social mm-hmm. media. And of course, the DM side is a totally different, uh, you know, kind of emotional interaction you're having with someone. There's nobody, there's no, there's no right. theatrics to it. Nobody else is witnessing it. It's just you and that person. Yep. And if obviously, if you can, if you can actually have a call with the person, uh, video call, phone call, yeah. that's even going to be more, you're going to have even more influence. If you have a person to person interaction with the person, not only is the person going to trust you more, they're going to see you as more credible, but you're going to be more likely to actually influence their their opinions on things. So the closer you can get to that, the better it is. Uh, the second step, I would say, is just listen to them. And while we may not like conspiracist group or extremist groups, they always are objectively the weaker group. They're smaller in size, weaker resources that are by definition non-mainstream. They know your perspective. They know what the mainstream narrative is. They don't need you to condescend to them and say, here, you sit here and let me tell you and lecture you about something you've already heard a thousand times over. What does seem to work is just saying, let me listen to you. You tell me your perspective on things. And you don't talk back. You don't give your opinion. You just listen. You absorb with lots of empathy. And the research has shown that people's defense, after after someone really feels that they've talked and that they've been heard, all their defenses drop down. Mm -hmm. And now negotiation and conversation is possible. But I would still urge people, don't jump in even in that conversation with, okay, now that that your defenses are down, let me just imagine. Immediately try to try try to influence you. That's probably also not going to work. In the beginning, you're probably going to hear a lot of the the standard rhetoric mm-hmm. and the narratives of the extremist group. You know, on the second, third, fourth, fifth time you're talking to them, what you're probably going to start to get to is the deeper underlying reasons for why they're that they're part of this group. So by listening, you can hear the stories, you can hear the real motivations, and you can start coming up with actual real solutions. But there's still the third step, which is for a lot of people, joining these extremist groups is solving problems that they had in their life. You talk to people who join extremist groups, they were suffering before. Yeah. They may have had drug addiction. They may have had heartbreak. They may have been going in and out of prison. They may have been totally lost and purposeless. They may have had no sense of belonging. When then joining the extremist group or the cult or the conspiracy group offers them all of those mm-hmm. uh, solutions. As long as they're happy within that group, they're not going to leave. Why would they leave? It would be totally irrational for them to, to, for you to convince them to go back to the life that they're trying to escape. Mm-hmm. But what may happen is that there may come a moment where, for idiosyncratic reasons, they may start questioning their 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 their, uh, their association with this group. And if you hear the stories, it's quite varies. For some people who were part of the jihadist movement, 9-11 was quite shocking to them. Yeah. And you hear stories about like, oh, I don't know if I want to be associated with that level of violence. That could be the chink in the armor. For other people, it's it's self victim. It's, it's victimization. The group starts bullying them, or starts victimizing them in some way. Then that becomes the kind of chink in the armor, and that makes them start questioning. Mm-hmm. Do I want to stay a member of this group? Now, that's the moment of opportunity. That's the cognitive opening. That's the moment at which this person, if you stayed in touch with them. Right. All these months, all these years, and you were just listening and listening, and now you know their inner psychology so well, now is the moment that you can potentially intervene and pull the person out. And you're not just going to pull them out and bring them back to the old life they had, because now you know exactly what was so bad about that life, what was so ex- what they were trying to escape. Hopefully, now you can help them find a new life that will not, you know, that will avoid some of the things that that they were escaping from in the first place. You've spoken about storytelling and narrative, and you decided to leave a successful acting career because of a conversation you had with a famous somebody, particularly about storytelling. Could you share that with us? Yeah, you've done some great research here. I didn't know that, that, that you even were, were aware of that anecdote. 
So it was actually Robin Williams, uh, and I was doing a, a play with him, uh, and uh, I I had a, I had a yeah I had a kind of a, a conversation with him after one of the the shows, and I said, "Hey, uh, Mr. Williams, I was in my early twenties. <laughs> like, I need some career advice here. I don't really know what I want to do with the rest of my life." And he was saying. I mean, you got a pretty good career going at such an early age, already acting, you know. And he goes, what else would you want to do? And at that time, I didn't really know the field of cognitive science, but I was like, ah, you know, I'm really interested in neuroscience and psychology. And he was, he just lit up. And it turns out he was a huge neuroscience nerd and he knew all this stuff about how the brain works, starts telling me all this stuff. And he says, he says, he goes, you got to do that. You got to go, go down that route. And he's saying, think about what we are as actors, we tell stories and hopefully it makes the world a better place. But now let's think about the role of storytelling, generally speaking, throughout humanity, right? Humans were storytellers, we're pattern seekers, and we're storytellers. And storytelling has helped us navigate the world. We've created religions based on stories. We've created political ideologies, national myths based on stories. We've gone to war over stories. We've killed other yeah. people because we think our story is right and someone else's story is wrong. The part that's still a mystery is that we're coming up with these stories also to understand ourselves. Are we inherently good? Are we inherently bad? Are we are we social? Are we are we more individualistic? Yeah. Who are we? We don't really know who we are. But now for the first time in humanity, because of neuroscience, we have a window into the brain. We can actually go in and see what's going on under the hood. And we can finally begin to ask and answer the questions that perplex the Upanishads, that perplex the Buddha, that perplexed the Enlightenment philosophers. And maybe we can start to grow some consensus on some story that is actually grounded in science and, and, and empiricism. And if we can gain consensus about that, then maybe we can start to come up with, with a story that we can all start to agree on. And maybe, maybe we'll stop killing each other as much. So he said, if you want to tell, if you want to be a storyteller, why not tell the most important story of all, the story of us, of who we are? Of course, this is very shocking to me. I wasn't uh, expecting Robin Williams to give such an eloquent uh, speech. I was honestly thinking he was going to say, you know, maybe change your middle name to Rodriguez so you can play <laughs> Mexicans too, or maybe introduce me to his agent would have been the uh, the more ideal uh, outcome yeah. of this conversation. But, you know, I, I, I eventually, uh, you know, found my way into this line of work. But, you know, to be honest, it was after all these interviews and talking to all these people. Like, I remember one young guy I was talking to on the border, the Turkish-Syrian border, a member of ISIS. I was trying to convince him to to come back with me yeah. to, the, to the British embassy. He was a young guy. He had just arrived. He maybe had been there for maybe a month. Mm -hmm. I said, you, you haven't really done anything too bad yet. We can, yeah. we can still kind of get you out and kind of return. And he said to me, he goes, what do you want me to do? You want me to go back to, my, uh, go back to the UK, get some job in some corner store, and that's just going to be the rest of my life, or stay here and be potentially a world-changing revolutionary? You tell me, if you were me, which life would you choose? And it was in that moment that I realized there was a bit of simplicity to what Robin Williams had told me, which is that I, with all, even with all this science in mind, I didn't have a better story to offer him. And I don't believe that science can come, can replace storytelling. Yeah. What it can do is it can make us more aware of the stories, the tropes that we're telling ourselves. And maybe it can open us up to new stories that we haven't thought about yet. Because the stories that extremist groups offer are historical. They're rooted, I mean, white nationalism and white supremacy, even if it's based off of false history, there's, there, there's a perception that it's based off of a nostalgic bygone era, right? And, yeah. and the caliphate is the same thing, the golden era of Islam. So there's all this nostalgia and history that they're writing on. But what is the alternative history? What is that, what is that vision of the future that's so attractive yeah. that, that is based on, you know, uh, interconnectedness of humanity of, uh, of, of peace and reconciliation and cooperation between all these different groups. What is that future vision that's as intoxicating for young people? Didn't you spend time in Molenbeek? Weren't you working on, or you were doing research on a, on a counter-engagement, which in, in a way, sort of, kind of hits that? 
So in Molenbeek, you know, I spent some time doing uh, many, many months over over a couple of years doing field work over there. I was trying to understand, you know, why these guys from Molenbeek were got pulled in to uh, to become foreign fighters. For a while, it was the neighborhood with the number one foreign fighter recruitment, the the core cell that carried out the Bataclan attacks yeah. in Paris in November 2015, as well as the March 2016 Brussels attacks, all came from Molenbeek. And, you know, it was a typical story. You're there, you're like, ah, you people don't have a lot of hope here. There's a lot of crime. Yeah. There's there's not really a lot of hope here. But during the time I was doing my field work, there was this um, incubator that kind of was, was was coming up, and it was called Molen Geek. And Molen it's Geek? Sort of, As in geek? Molen Geek. <laughs> That's brilliant. Geek. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and it was called Molen Geek. And uh, and basically what they were doing there just started off as, as, as kind of like a co-working space. But they also were, it was also an incubator. So you could come in and bring in ideas that you have to, mm-hmm. to create a new app and whatever. But it ended up really expanding very fast within a couple of years. And there was a lot of investment put into it, a lot of excitement. And before you knew it, there were dozens and dozens of young kids from Molenbeek coming and hanging out at this incubator where it was nice and a stylish building. Yeah. They were they were coming up with ideas for apps. Most of the apps had a positive sort of like a pro-social mm-hmm. impact. And before you knew it, in this you know otherwise fairly impoverished neighborhood, you had this sort of hub of hope that was there in the middle of this neighborhood and there was there was a pride that people took and spending time over there. People wanted to go and, and spend time there. So it became this sort of portal that had opened up within Molen Beak where people feel like I can step through this portal and on the other end of it, I can have an amazing life. And so I do think things like that and the more of those you can open up in some of these neighborhoods, it kind of in an organic way starts yeah. changing people's identities. It starts changing yeah. people's prospects for the lives that they can lead. It starts making them excited about their own their own lives in a way that they may not have felt excited about before. Fascinating. Let me just end with some quick fire questions. Question number one is, do you think we can profile terrorists? No, um, and I don't even think it's a it's 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 a good idea. Just because then they can game the system easily. Yeah, yeah, but there's still uh, quite a lot of demand for it. But yeah, yeah. Uh, question number two: Can anyone get radical? I guess it depends on what you mean by by radicalized. So for me, radicalization just means that you're increasing your propensity towards violence. Yes, so I would say in that sense, anybody can be part of a political movement where they feel that in the end, violence is the only option Mm -hmm. and that there's sort of a euphoria of becoming a devoted actor. Now, can anyone get radicalized into any group? I think that's going to be much harder to do because obviously certain certain values and groups will resonate more with certain people than others. What's the most pressing issue you think we should be addressing right now? I think we need to be looking much more at... um, atomization of society and social fragmentation. Because so much of, you know, we're increasingly moving into a a less and less certain world. Uncertainty, there's mm-hmm. going to be a tsunami of uncertainty that's about to hit our shore soon. Um, there's a lot of objective uncertainty that's going on in the world. But one thing that we know that helps people deal with objective uncertainty is the fact that they belong, that they have social yeah. cohesion uh, within their communities. And that can actually not only lessen the impact of objective uncertainty, it can even help people in war zones not get symptoms of PTSD, even when there's bombs dropping outside. You know, so we're not even just talking about, you know, in Western society here, even in war zones, social cohesion can actually protect people from PTSD. So it's incredibly important um, that people feel that they belong. Now, the problem is, is which group you choose to belong to, right? You can choose to belong to a group that is basically pluralistic in their mindset and they don't believe in, 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 non, in, in zero-sum competition with other groups versus you can belong to a group that absolutely sees itself in competition with other groups and that our group's loss is another group's gain or vice versa. Yeah, yeah. So fostering pluralistic uh, groups and letting people get get involved in those. Are there any PVE or uh, reintegration initiatives you think we should see more of? I would say, again, some of these things that kind of get people involved in, you know, community-based programs mm-hmm. that give them a sense of, that give them a sense of brotherhood and sisterhood, but there's also a certain degree of action orientation to it. The part that's so appealing about extremist groups is that it's not just about hanging out and doing fun stuff, that there is this social justice yeah. part of it. Yeah, yeah. That, that you're part of a moral tribe, not just a brotherhood and a sisterhood, that you're 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 trying to do some good as a collective. You're fighting injustice in some way. And I don't see a lot of that happening. 
I don't see that social justice element being plugged into some of the let's get people involved in, in alternative groups before they get pulled into radicalization. So I think that's a really important thing. Are there any myths about radicalization you'd like to dispel? It's going to sound like I'm going to say something that's contradictory. So I would say for the general public, there's this idea that, you know, people who are extremists, that yeah, they're crazy or something, you know, they all have these huge mental health issues and the extremists, uh, the, you know, the, the people who, who research this have pushed back on that quite hard, saying, mm-hmm. no, that, that's not fully true. I, I think that's an important message for the general public because then they'll start realizing, oh, maybe my son, my daughter, whatever can get pulled into this group, even though they seem so-called normal in a lot of ways. But for the research community and the practitioner and the policy community, I think we have been downplaying the role of trauma and mental health in radicalization. So I've just been in my role at ICSR and we're looking at the role of trauma Mm. and mental health issues in, uh, in radicalization. And there is very, very good reason to suspect that unhealed trauma can make someone more susceptible to extremism. So generally NGOs and, you know, USAID, UK aid, they do invest a little bit in trying to help people with with, with complex PTSD and so forth in these war-afflicted areas. But they do it for a humanitarian reason. They don't realize that there's actually a security reason to be doing it as well. That actually, if you have especially complex trauma, your ability to, to deal with uncertainty, your ability to actually function in some of the most basic ways is very is very much undermined. You have high anxiety and depression. You're really in a state of suffering. And some of what these extremist groups offer actually can help with the symptoms of complex PTSD. And this is scary that actually in some of these war-affected areas, the best thing you can do for your mental health is to join a terrorist group. Think about that. The best thing you can do to heal your mental health issues is to join a terrorist group because it'll provide you with the necessary social cohesion and support and sense of purpose and the sacred values and the ideology that that simplifies the complex world and creates binaries and black and white and clear red lines and structure in your life and, and gives you a framework to look at this messy world in a much more simplified way. So we've got to make it such that the best thing you can do for your own mental health is not joining a terrorist group. You know, you yeah. want to heal the complex PTSD and the mental health as early as possible, especially amongst young people, because there's a window of opportunity for young kids, many of who have experienced pretty bad trauma in the last years, who are now in puberty. There's a window of opportunity where research has shown if you can start healing some of their trauma in, in the kind of puberty age, you can almost make it by the time they're in adults as though they never experienced the trauma. You can bring them back to where mm-hmm. they would have been had they never experienced the trauma. So we really got to think about, you know, those those thousands and even tens of thousands of young kids, many of them orphans in places like Al Hol, who are definitely at risk for, for creating complex PTSD, who are going to be right pickings for groups like ISIS. Yeah. My final question was, uh, what's the main takeaway you want practitioners and policymakers to know but that that trauma point that that may be it. But I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. No, I mean, I mean that. And at this point, this is I would like to just leave it at that. That that is a really you know uh, a key issue there. Nafis Hamid, thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Going to Extremes is produced in Doha, Qatar, by the International Hub for Behavioral Insights to Counter Terrorism. This series is a product of the United Nations Office of Counterterrorism. The information and opinions presented in this podcast by the guest speakers are those of the speakers. They do not purport to reflect the opinion or views of the UNOCT, the United Nations, or any of its affiliated organizations. For more information, visit our website, un.org forward slash counterterrorism. You can follow us on Twitter using the handle at UN underscore OCT. And join the conversation using the hashtag going to extremes. <laughs>